week it's been in terms of weather. And apparently again today too. So the Lord is gracious. Um, Maltby Babcock was a pastor in New York in uh, the late 1800s. And he was sort of like a lot of people today in that he loved to hike and run out in the woods and around. And he would frequently tell his, his secretary, I'm going to see my father's world. And that's where the hymn comes from that we're about to sing. This is my father's world. Let's stand as we sing. Thank you. 
leader. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Now, today's readings is from Romans 12, uh, starting in verse 9. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with God's people who are in need, practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people in low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live in peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if, you're hung if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Let's pray. Father, we, we live in a, a, a turbulent time. and We don't know what's going on. We don't know how it's going to turn out. But Father, you do. And you are in control. And as, as the reading just said, we need to repay evil with good. We need to love our enemies. We need to take care of them. Father, again, you know what's going to happen. We don't, but we do know that you're in control. So Father, help us to have comfort in that. Through Christ we pray, amen. Good morning, church. How are we doing today? Welcome to those who are on our live stream this morning. I love our church. I just want to tell you that I Amen. love our church. Um, to those who are on the live stream, you are just as much a part of our church as those in the room. So I want to let you know that it might feel different at home, but you're still part of our church family. And this is a time where people need to be connected to the church mm -hmm. more than ever. We need one another. We can't do this alone. Um, thank you, Mark, for praying. I'm going to pray again like I normally do. It's not that Mark's prayer wasn't good in that. <laughs> uh, but I want to pray for us. <laughs> Father, help us not to forget who you are. In the confusion and the madness of our world, we need to remember who you are, that you are holy, that you are worthy, that you are sovereign, and that there's no one like you. Yeah. And that's why we as a church, we come every Sunday to worship you, yes. to adore you, to remind ourselves, God, that you are in control. Yeah. You're not surprised by anything. And so I pray for us as a church, God, that we would just continue to yield to your authority and your leadership in our lives. And I'm so thankful that we have a church family to be a part of, that we don't have to do this alone. And so, God, I pray that you continue to strengthen the bonds of our relationships, our community. We need one another during this difficult time. 
And God, I thank you that every Sunday we can open up your word. Uh, we can come before your word and not only listen to what it says, but God, we want to live it out. We want your word to be alive in our lives. And so I pray this morning, God, we would not just hear the word, we would receive it and we would respond to you. And God, you know every Sunday how much I need you. So I'm going to just declare it once again. I need you. I pray that you would use me as your servant, that the words that come out of my mouth would be from you and for you and your glory. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. So 2020, what do you have for us next? <laughs> we are living in a time like no other in our generations. We are a divided nation, a world battling a global virus, a time when the world is on edge and people are so fragile and so volatile right now. It's times like this that our faith in Christ should anchor us. A friend texted me this week a quote from Thomas Merton that I've never heard before, but Merton once wrote, perfect hope is achieved at the brink of despair. When instead of falling over the edge, we find ourselves walking on air. Perfect hope is achieved at the brink of despair. At the edge of despair that our world is living in right now, our hope in Christ becomes the solid ground that we stand on. And we acknowledge that God sustains us day by day as individuals and as a church family. And our hope is not in the things or the outcomes in this world it is completely and firmly in him. So no matter the outcome of the presidential election, who you voted for, no matter the stage we are in in this pandemic, this is still our father's world. And we not, not only need to sing that truth, we need to believe it in the core of our beings. So I hope and pray that this challenging season of 2020 is anchoring your hope even deeper and stronger in God. And that 2020 is making it clear where your trust should be. So this morning, we're going to continue where we left off last Sunday in the book of Acts, chapter 9. So I want to invite you, if you have your Bible, turn with me to Acts, chapter 9. And we're going to start in verse 19. So last week we saw how Saul, he's on the Damascus road, and he has this encounter with Jesus Christ, and it changed everything for him. Jesus Christ transformed his life, and God brings Ananias into Saul's life, and then Saul is connected to the other disciples in Damascus, and that's where we're going to begin this morning in verse 19. So Acts chapter 9, verse 19. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once, he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, Isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on this name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. So after spending a few days with the other followers of Christ in Damascus, it says at once Saul began to preach in the synagogues. So these are probably the same synagogues where he had gotten a letter from the high priest in Jerusalem to come and arrest Christians. And instead of persecuting against Christ, He's now preaching for Christ. At once, Saul began to preach in the synagogues. There, there's a tension that I feel here with this phrase, at once. On one hand, Saul was a trained rabbi, a teacher. So he had the pedigree, the experience, the, the knowledge, especially in the Old Testament scriptures. He knew them well. Most of us don't have Saul's pedigree 
and background when we first come to Christ. So we don't typically ask a person who's a one week old Christian to stand up and preach on a Sunday morning. That's never <laughs> happened in any church I've been a part of. So that's one side of the tension. On the other hand, there's an immediacy here for Saul in using the gifts God has given him and not waiting. And this is where I want to focus in on. God has gifted you in different ways. You might not be a teacher like Saul, but God has given you other gifts. And he wants you to be active in using them for him. A lot of times we wait to get more trained or feel more ready. But I think God is wanting us to jump in more, get involved, trust him, let the Holy Spirit lead us. So I remember the first time I was asked to lead a small group in college. It was my sophomore year. I did not feel ready. I did not feel equipped whatsoever. And I tried to come up with every excuse I could to get out of doing it. But my leaders were so persistent with me. And I'll never forget the first time I was leading that small group. I was on my knees in my dorm room praying and crying out to God. My inadequacy, not feeling ready, it drove me to my knees. It taught me to depend on God, to trust him, and to serve him when called upon So we'll get back to this point in a few minutes. So the focus of Saul's preaching is what? Jesus is the son of God and that Jesus is the Messiah. And this is huge. A few days prior, Saul would have thought this notion that Jesus is God is not only foolish, it's blasphemous. But now he's preaching this very truth. Jesus is the Messiah. And the Israelites have been waiting centuries for the coming Messiah. And Saul now got it. It's Jesus. Jesus is the one I have been waiting for. Jesus is the one the Israelites have been waiting for. And we can understand how confused the people in the synagogues would be in this moment that Saul's preaching that Jesus is the Messiah. They knew all about his past. And now they were hearing a complete 180 in his teachings. Verse 23. After many days had gone by, there was a conspiracy among the Jews to kill him. But Saul learned of their plan. Day and night, they kept close watch on the city gates in order to kill him. But his followers took him by night and lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. So the Jews who are listening to Saul in Damascus, they're they're not happy whatsoever. And the tables really turn here. Saul was the one who was a dangerous threat. And now Saul's life is in danger. And a conspiracy arises and Saul is in trouble. And God had raised a group up, though, who are now following Saul. So he's got his own little posse of Christians. And whoever they were, they were looking out for Saul. They were committed to preserving his life. And this next part feels like a scene in a movie. Trapped in Damascus, a city with high walls. And there's no way out for Saul. And the clock is ticking. And his friends are scrambling, trying to come up with a plan. And one of the guys found a basket of all things. And this isn't like an Easter candy basket or a basket for flowers. It's most likely a net that they use to carry bales of hay down the wall. So they put Saul in this net as quiet as it can. And they lower him down the wall. And everybody's just waiting. Is he going to make it? His feet hit the ground. And he scrambles out of Damascus. He makes it out. It's a crazy scene. So the next part of the passage, we find Saul in Jerusalem. And there's good reason to believe some time had passed between Saul leaving Damascus and arriving in Jerusalem based on some other scriptures. Verse 26. When he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. 
But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord, and that the Lord had spoken to him, and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He talked and debated with the Hellenistic Jews, but they tried to kill him. When the believers learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. So Saul heads back to Jerusalem, and just like Ananias was skeptical, disciples in Jerusalem, they're, they're ready to welcome Paul with open arms. Saul had already done significant damage in the church in Jerusalem. They're probably thinking this is Saul's next trick up his sleeve. He's going to pretend to be a disciple now. But there was one guy who had Saul's back. And just like God used Ananias in Damascus, God brings Barnabas into Saul's life. If you remember, remember back to Acts 4, when we're introduced to Barnabas, that's actually his nickname. And it means son of encouragement. So Barnabas is living out the meaning of his name as an encourager. He's the one who's there with Saul and encouraging the other disciples that Saul is legit. You can trust that he is really following Jesus. And just like in Damascus, Saul didn't hold back in Jerusalem. He began to preach and speak boldly in the name of Jesus, specifically to the Hellenistic Jews. What's interesting here is these Jews might have been the same people that Stephen was debating with before he got martyred. So this is an incredible turn of events. Saul is following in the footsteps of Stephen now, the man he oversaw being put to death. But the Jews have not changed, and they're ready to do to Saul what they did to Stephen. And Saul's life is in jeopardy again. So the believers get him out of Jerusalem and send him back to his hometown of Tarsus. So to summarize, Saul has just come to Christ. And what we see in Acts chapter 9 is that Saul's newfound faith is active and alive. Active and alive. He didn't wait around until he was ready. He jumps right in. Active and and alive, not passive and dormant. And this is a reminder and challenge to us that we are called to an active faith, not a passive faith. So I think about a person who wants to get in better shape. They buy an exercise video like Richard Simmons, sweating to the oldies. Classic, right? Oh man. And so they get this DVD in the mail. And they watch it over and over and over again. They have all the exercises memorized. They, they can explain it and share it with their friends. But if they don't actually do the exercise, it doesn't do them any good. You can't just watch an exercise video. You have to do the exercise. The same is true about our faith in Christ. It's got to move from just knowing about it to living it out. We have always been called to a faith that is to be practiced, not just talked about. This was years ago, but one summer we lost power in our neighborhood. And I didn't know it was our neighborhood at the time. I thought it was just our house. So I went downstairs to our circuit breaker. I'm checking all the switches. And I, I went to the main switch. And I switched it off and then back on. What I didn't realize, I didn't turn it all the way back on. It was kind of in the middle. And so when other neighbors were getting their power on, our power didn't come back on because our switch wasn't on. And I'm embarrassed to say this was like a couple of days <laughs> we were without power because I didn't know what was going on. And I want you to think about a circuit breaker. There's all these individual breakers that correspond to a certain part of your home. In a similar way, our spiritual lives have different components. We need to make sure the power is on in each of these areas. These areas are spiritually active and alive, not dormant 
and off. And this is where the Holy Spirit comes into play. He wants to make sure that the power and connection is working in all areas of your life. So I want to use this illustration of a, a circuit breaker. Talk about three areas of our spiritual life that we got to check and make sure the power is on. And we talk a lot about the importance of the Bible, making sure we're getting into God's word. And I want to remind you, Sunday morning is not enough. You need more of the Bible than on just Sunday morning. Reading the Bible has to move into our everyday life. It has to move into Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, not just Sunday. And if you need help figuring out how do I get into the Bible more, all of our leaders would be happy to sit down and talk with you or chat on the phone and help you get into the Word of God more. So read your Bible, yes. Get into God's Word, yes. But it's more than just reading the Bible. And I think maybe some of us get stuck there. We're reading the Bible. It's got to move beyond just reading it. We need to do what the Bible says. We're called to live out God's word, not just know God's word. And this might be part of the switch that God needs to activate in your life right now. And maybe you have a routine where you're reading the Bible every day and it just it gets that routine. And you got to, when you spend time in the word each day, talk to God. God, how do I live this out now? The book of James is all about us having an active faith. And James wrote in chapter 1, verse 22, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. James can't get any more clear than that. You can't just listen to it. You have to do what the word of God says. So I want to give you an example from my life this week. I'm reading through the Minor Prophets right now. It's in the book of Habakkuk, chapter 3 this week. And I read this verse, these two verses that really encouraged me. As though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet... Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I'll be joyful in God, my Savior. The temptation for me, I read a verse like that. Okay, it's, just, it's a cool verse. It's, it's good truth. When I, when I read that verse that day, I'm like, God, can you help me to try to live this truth out? That today, no matter what happens, the ups and downs, I want to take joy in you because you're my savior. I have salvation in you. Not just knowing the truth, but asking the Holy Spirit to activate that truth in our lives. Having an active faith means we live out God's word. We don't just listen to it and read it. So another circuit breaker area that we need to make sure is connected is prayer. And I'm so thankful that God has shown our church time and time again the priority and the importance of prayer. I'm so thankful we're a church that intercedes for the needs that arise in our congregation. I just want to say way to go, church. Thank you, Dennis, for being faithful, sending out the requests. And I know you guys are praying as those requests come about. So let's keep praying, yes. But I think for a way for us to live out our faith in a more active and connected way, as you pray for someone, reach out to them. Tell them you're praying for them. Send them an email. Shoot them a text. Pick up the phone and just say, I was just thinking of you, and I'm praying for you. So when Dennis sends out a request about someone in our church family, I'm hoping that our church will rally around that person and email and call and text them and let them know we are praying for you. We are with you. This moves prayer from a private endeavor to more active, connected reality. It, it makes prayer not only a vertical connection with God, 
but a horizontal connection for us in the body of Christ. It's also a way for us to demonstrate compassion and care and encouragement to one another. And I'm sure if you're on the receiving end of someone saying, you know, I'm thinking of you and praying for you, that's not going to make you upset, is it? No, you're going to be delighted and encouraged and strengthened to receive that from someone else. So the final area I really believe we need to pay attention to and ask God to reactivate in us right now is serving. And I feel this is where the pandemic has really challenged us. It's taken away many of the opportunities that people were used to serving in the church and serving in the local community. There are a lot of limitations and barriers right now. I, I get that. And yet Romans 12, 11 tells us, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. I'm concerned as a church, we're losing some of our spiritual fervor because we're not as active in serving the Lord these days. I think this is where we need to rely on the Holy Spirit. I believe the Holy Spirit wants to give us wisdom and creativity and how to serve in new ways right now. That if God is calling us to not be lacking in zeal, to keep our spiritual fervor serving the Lord, God is going to direct us. He's going to show us how to do that, that given the challenging times we're in. So I want to encourage you, if you're feeling stuck in this area, how do I serve right now? What does that look like? I want to challenge you, just come before God in prayer and ask him. Ask God, how do you want me to serve right now? Lean into the Holy Spirit. And as God guides you, I just want to encourage you to be willing to try something new. Take a risk. Get out of your comfort zone. Church, God calls us to an active faith, to put into practice what we believe. May God activate some of the circuits in our spiritual lives to make sure the power is on right now. That we're connected to him and obedient to him in all areas of our lives. So the last verse in this passage text talks about the condition of the early church at this point in time. So let's look at verse 31. It says, then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened. Living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit, it increased in numbers. It's really cool to hear how the church had moved beyond the borders of Judea and Galilee, and now was in Samaria too. The church is expanding and growing. And after a time of fleeing from persecution, the church now experienced a time of peace and strengthening. It says here, living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit, it increased in numbers. Have you ever gone to a social engagement and you thought the dress was casual? <laughs> and you show up at this event in your casual dress and, and you're looking around the room and everybody's in their formal wear. And you're like, I didn't get the memo on this one. <laughs> well, what, what do you do in that moment? Do you stick around? Do you go home and change? I would go home and change for sure. <laughs> Casual versus formal. I, I think at times we can get too casual in our relationship with God. That we lose what this verse is talking about. Living in the fear of the Lord. Even though it's a time of peace and the early church wasn't afraid of human threats anymore. They didn't lose their fear of the Lord. And what this means is having a holy reverence for who our God is. Not losing sight that God is the almighty one. He is to be feared and awed and worshipped. This is about not having a casual posture in our relationship with God, but growing in our reverence for him. So, so practically speaking, what does it look like on a daily basis for you to revere God? To, to worship God in your personal life? Do you spend time each day just acknowledging who God is? That he is awesome and great, 
and holy and righteous and worthy. This is something I need to grow in right now. I want to have more of a daily reverence and a holy fear for our God. I believe we all need this in our everyday life. There are a lot of threats and fears in our world right now, but I believe too many are missing this living in fear of the Lord. I believe God is wanting to activate this in us right now. We have this daily posture before him of awe and reverence of his holiness and awesomeness. Living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. I believe we're in a time right now, we are bombarded by discouragement all the time. I feel it. Every week, I feel there are discouragement bombs going off in my life. And I'm confident you're feeling the same thing. And these discouragement bombs are some sort of bad news. You know, it just knocks the wind out of us. And it affects us. It, it burdens us. And I believe we need what this verse is talking about. Encouragement by the Holy Spirit. In John 14, Jesus says, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things, will remind you of everything I've said to you. Jesus says the Holy Spirit is the advocate. Other translations use the word comforter. The Holy Spirit is your advocate, church. He is with you. He is for you. He is defending you. He wants to bring the power of his comfort and encouragement in your life every day. The early church was encouraged by the Holy Spirit. And I believe God wants to do the same for us right now. The Holy Spirit wants to encourage us. And this week, when I was feeling discouraged, you know, after many days, I just, I just told God, God, I'm feeling so discouraged right now. And you know all about it. And I just invited the Holy Spirit to encourage me. And honestly, it took a few days before I really began to sense the encouragement from the Holy Spirit. But I believe God wants us to come to him when we're discouraged, just to be honest with him. And we need to invite the Holy Spirit to encourage us. I think sometimes God is just waiting for us to just come to him and for us to ask, to invite his encouragement over our lives. Throughout the book of Acts, we see how involved the Holy Spirit wants to be in our lives. And part of having a living and active faith is learning to interact and relate to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit wants a relationship with you. The Holy Spirit wants to encourage you. I think one of the gifts that the world needs right now from God's people is encouragement. God using us to bring encouragement is one of the ways I believe God is going to open up people's hearts to Christ right now. And I want to ask you this week to look for ways to be an encouragement in someone else's life. To drop an encouragement bomb and just bless them. Encourage them and love them right where they're at in a world that is dropping discouragement bombs. May we rise up and be people that drop encouragement bombs in people's lives. I believe the challenge with the pandemic is creating a passivity in our world. And a passivity possibly in the church. My hope and prayer is for us as a church that we are active and engaged in living out our faith in Christ right now. And don't just listen to the words of the sermon this morning. I want to ask you to be decisive this morning. Make a commitment this morning. Do something in response. James 1, again, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. So I want to pray for us now. This would be true of us. Not only hear the word of God this morning, we would respond. We would do something. The Holy Spirit would lead 
and guide us. So let's pray together. Father God, I, I want to just ask right now that we as your people would be defenseless before you right now. No pretension, no hiding, just completely open, God, to what you want to say and speak into us right now. And help us to be honest. Help us be honest with where we're at. And I pray, God, that you would turn on the power and reactivate any dormant areas right now in our spiritual lives. For us, as we get into to God's word, and I'll be honest, God, it becomes routine for me. I don't want to treat your word as a routine or a discipline. So God, I pray that you would help me to just reactivate not only reading your word, but living out your word right now. And God, I pray, especially for our church with the challenges of, of serving right now. There are so many limitations and barriers, God, but I pray that you would break through those barriers, that you would give us wisdom and guidance and discernment, how we can stay active and engaged in serving right now. Because this world needs the church alive and active. And God, I pray we would live in the fear of the Lord. Forgive us if we have treated you too casually. And I pray, God, there would just be this daily reverence and awe before you. God, that you would activate that in our lives this week. That we would not let a day go by without spending some time just sitting before you and adoring you, acknowledging your greatness and your worth. And I, I, I guess and sense that many are discouraged right now. Many are dealing with discouragement bombs that are going off constantly in their lives. God, I just, Holy Spirit, I want to ask you right now that you would encourage your people that you would be the advocate, the comforter. Wherever we're discouraged right now, God, that you would pick us up. Remind us to take joy in you. And even if the circumstances don't change, we remember we have you in our lives. That you are with us and you love us and you have a plan. So God, minister your encouragement to your people right now. And God, as we sing these final songs, I pray that you would activate that reverence before you in our worship, in our singing, that we would delight in just declaring truths about you through songs. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. The Holy Spirit wants to encourage you this morning, wants to encourage all of us, whether here or whether on Zoom or wherever we may be. And the right response to that is worship. So let's stand and sing, and we're going to worship our almighty God.
hope you don't hear from the message this idea just don't be discouraged because the reality is a lot of us have challenging things right now what we see in the psalms especially the psalmist man their lives were a mess too and broken but they just brought it before god they were honest with him and so often you're reading a psalm and it's like the discouragement and then it's transformed into worship and that's what happens. God will take our discouragement as we spend time with him. And he'll remind us who he is and why we can be encouraged 
I want you to receive 2 Thessalonians 2, 16 to 17 as the benediction. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope, encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word.